Thanks a million. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, Connor Clark is my name from uh, the Office of Public Works. My apologies if any of you have heard this already because I presented it this morning and it is the same presentation. It's so good, I've been asked to do it again. Uh, anyway, first of all, just very briefly what the Office of Public Works is because to a lot of people in Ireland uh, that associate it mainly with her our heritage buildings, which uh, we look after, but actually one of the main functions uh, of OPW is property management. And what we do is we look after the portfolio of buildings for the entire central government. So that's all the central government departments, revenue, social welfare, agriculture, etc, etc. Uh, and we basically either build those buildings for them or we lease them for them, we maintain them and uh, we operate them. So there's about 2,000 properties that OBW uh, looks after, which is about a million square meters of floor space. It's predominantly office accommodation for those departments that I'm talking about, but we also have uh, data centers, uh, we have the heritage buildings, as I was saying there a minute ago, and uh, we have laboratories and stuff like that, but predominantly it's office accommodation. We have a total energy spend uh, in those buildings of somewhere between about 35 and 40 million euros a year. So for our clients, and our clients being the uh, departments that occupy those buildings, uh, we provide technical expertise. So OPW has very large section of architects. Uh, we have uh, mechanical and electrical engineers, uh, one of which is me. Um, we have quantity surveyors, structural engineers, civil engineers, and so that. And we provide, as I say, technical expertise to the, the occupying departments. And we work, work closely with them on a day-to-day -day basis. <coughs> One of the uh, things about, the, we, we provide the buildings but, uh, and we manage them, uh, but the individual occupying departments pay for energy. Whereas that can be problematic for some, sort of the, some of the models that uh, are out there for energy efficiency projects. It's not OPW that actually pays for the energy. So energy conservation in the public service in Ireland, we're very much, so we're aiming for the uh, goals of the Energy Efficiency Directive, and then we have the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan, which sets out how Ireland will achieve its 2020 uh, targets, okay? And one of those is a 20% uh, increase in energy efficiency, but for the public sector, that target is actually 33%. So when that originally came out, uh, we commented that we thought it was very ambitious, but what I'd say is, from what we've done so far, it is certainly, uh, it's ambitious, but it is achievable. Uh, but we say there's no room for complacency. But what I want to talk to you about today is uh, energy conservation programs, particularly behavioral change programs, and what is the scope for energy efficiency within those. And I want to talk about a program we've had running now since 2008, which is called Optimizing Power at Work. So the milestones in this program, uh, and really one of the things that separates it from a lot of other behavioral change campaigns that have been run in the past and been run not only in Ireland but throughout Europe, is that the first thing that we do is we install energy monitoring equipment in any building before it starts participating in the campaign. So this campaign is very much based on benchmark energy consumption data for each building, setting targets against that data, and then driving savings and reporting back what those savings are. So it's all real data as opposed to uh, a lot of energy efficiency campaigns which we run in the past, which is information provided to people, maybe behavioral change, but very difficult to track what savings have been achieved. So we initially we ran, the first thing we did, we installed energy monitoring equipment in all our large buildings. That was about between 250 and 270 initially. And we ran a pilot study in 10 of those buildings to see what was the scope for energy saving in them. Okay, so this really was where we, without capital investment in the buildings, but we did put energy specialists working in each building. We set up energy teams around them, and we worked very much uh, on optimizing the existing controls that were in the building, and then working with the staff to bring on behavioral change to see what was the scope for energy savings. Um, they proved very successful, uh, the, the pilot studies, I'll go into some detail there in a second, but um, after that then we rolled out a very large scale program in 270 buildings which has been running since 2008. So. It wasn't rocket science stuff, what we were concentrating on really was switching off as much equipment as possible in a building, be it centralized equipment or local equipment, 
uh, if it doesn't need to be on. If it does need to be on, we switch it off as early as possible. And using staff and experts basically to identify where energy savings, where there was energy wastage, okay? And what we found is there is lots of energy wastage that can be targeted. What we found in the pilot study was that about 59% of the total energy consumption, the average in the buildings, is electrical consumption. But that constituted 78% of our CO2 emissions. That's probably changed a little bit now in the, in the years, but electricity was particularly dirty fuel. And uh, so although it was 60% really of the consumption, it was much higher percentage of the CO2 emissions. With electricity as well, staff have a direct influence. Not so much with the thermal side of things, uh, where it tends to be centrally controlled, but particularly with electricity, um, as you'll know yourself, staff can influence it directly in a building. And when we benchmarked our electric consumption against some published figures for the UK, we found that uh, it was fairly poor. One of the big lessons we learned from this pilot study was that 35% of our electrical consumption was at night, okay, so after 8 o'clock, and between 8 o'clock at night and 8 o'clock the next morning, and 20% was at the weekends. So 55% of our electricity use was during periods when the building was unoccupied. So I've just got a couple of graphs there showing five of the buildings that were in the pilot study. And they were all pretty much the same. The maroon being the uh, unoccupied periods and the purple is the occupied periods. Just taking electrical consumption. And it's quite astonishing the amount of electricity that's been burned when no one's in the building at all. And it's not just a civil service phenomenon. We found this in a lot of other sectors as well, or any sector we've spoken to. There was huge scope for saving uh, during unoccupied periods, as long as you can monitor it. So we set the targets when we launched the program. We wanted to, uh, sorry, the pilot study showed some of the buildings were capable of savings up to 19%. So we set a target of 20% saving uh, across our building stock in the, in the large program. And we wanted every building to achieve a minimum of 15% savings. Buildings already got to 20, we looked for an additional 5%. So the program really focuses around three key elements, and that's technology, specialist expertise, and continuous staff engagement, which I'll talk about now in a second. Other things that are very important, though, is endorsement at senior management level. So buy-in from the top in each building or each organization we found critical for the success of the thing. And active energy teams, so a large amount of staff participating in this is also a key to success. So OPW provide the technology aspect of this. Uh, we provide the specialist expertise, but we rely on the people engaging with the program, so the buildings that are participating to, to uh, provide the staff or get, let the staff engage with the program. Okay, so technology. By that I mean what I said before is we install uh, energy monitoring equipment before we do anything. So it's absolutely, we won't do anything unless we have benchmark data built up for the building. We're collecting the data on a 15 minute basis. Okay, so all electricity, uh, gas, LPG, biomass, you name it, is every energy consuming process in that building, we're recording it every 15 minutes. And we, we store it all in the central uh, database, which is accessible over the internet. And we have various data analysis packages to sit on top of the database, crunching the numbers and preparing reports for us. And we've got over 300 buildings now on that system. <coughs> By specialist expertise, what I mean is the application of uh, adequate and suitable uh, specialist resources. So a lot of campaigns falter on the fact that they start off with an initial flurry of activity. We provide people with the information, but then there's no real follow-up to it, and they tend to die off. The success of any behavioral change campaign, in my experience, is it's a constant repetition, okay? Or it's not even just repeating the same message. It's working with people continuously to try and harness the savings. So we dedicate a lot of uh, money, really, to providing resources uh, to work in each of the buildings that's participating. And we have specialists working with the energy teams that are set up in these buildings. So a proper resource is an experienced specialist. And um, what we say is, though, by applying suitable resources, it's reasonable that we can set targets and that we expect results to be delivered. So in the last bit of the, uh, the three fundamentals is the continuous staff engagement. So every building uh, has an energy officer appointed. Uh, they have energy teams then built around them. 
And then we run all sorts of uh, workshops and staff information days and that type of thing. Uh, we produce reports like are shown here uh, on a monthly basis where it's specific obviously to the building that we're working in and uh, we will target specific areas each month that we want to work on for the, the next period and then we report back to the energy team. So we run workshops, uh, we do night audits in each building. So we night load, as I said earlier on, is a real one that can be concentrated on to get uh, savings. And uh, we regularly, at least twice a year, in every office building, we'll unannounced do a night audit just to see exactly what's on and where energy has been used in that building. And it's quite astonishing to see even buildings that we think are operating efficiently, the amount of stuff that really is on that doesn't need to be on. Uh, BMS is just down the end. We uh, spend a lot of time auditing BMS uh, or building management systems in each of those buildings, optimizing controls. I mean, what we would find is a lot of BMSs go in day one, and as long as the building operates uh, comfortably, people aren't particularly interested in what the BMS settings are. So we do constantly go back and review the settings of the BMS and change strategies and that type of thing. And we have a national awards program, uh, which basically, well, we run it about every 18 months just to recognize some of the best performing buildings uh, in the program. So, as I said already, the on-site energy team uh, is really the key to this, one of the main factors, and to them we provide all the various uh, supports. So, one of the ones that worked, things that worked very well for us was staff awareness days. And initially, we were getting a lot of questions on, people were more interested in, in their own homes, uh, Insulation, new boiler, sort of thing. No, 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 this program has nothing to do with your home. This is an office. But, and what we found was that actually, by providing people with information that relates to them at home and how they can save money and save energy, they're far more engaging in the process. So now we spend a lot of time actually providing information on uh, insulation retrofits, on grants available, on boilers and stuff, just to build up general staff uh, engagement with our program. Um, the annual awards, yeah. So we run awards for, say, best naturally ventilated building, best air conditioned building in different to different provinces. And uh, but then we can also recognize sort of best energy teams who may not be performing the best in numbers terms, but are engaging very well with the process. And what I'd say is that really the key is the level of engagement equals the level of savings. Okay, so about two years into the program, we uh, categorized each of the buildings that were participating, we asked uh, our service providers basically to put them into different silos. Would we say that the level of engagement was excellent? Was it good or was it fair? And when we looked at what savings we were getting from those, the excellent engagement were achieving an average 19%. The goods were 12% and the fares were 2%. But very interestingly for us is that we had a number of buildings that were in the pro or we had, so they weren't in the program. We were monitoring for energy consumption, but they weren't participating in the campaign for one reason or another. And what we found that the average increase in those buildings was 11% over the first 18 months or two years. So it wasn't the case they just stayed still, their consumption continued to increase. So then, quickly just to get to the meat of the thing, our, uh, what savings have we achieved? So back in 2009, really would have been the first year that we were reporting on the 270 buildings, our savings were just below 15% in energy terms. It's gone up and down over the last number of years, but in 2014, the sa so when I say savings, what we're doing is we take the a benchmark year for each building was the year before they started participating in the campaign. And then we're constantly comparing to what is your energy consumption now compared to that year. And in 2014, uh, across the building stock, like that saving was just over 20%. So <clears throat> this graph is a bit difficult uh, to explain, but what it is, is it's the level of savings uh, on the x-axis. So savings, the first green bar in the middle here, will be savings of 0 to 10%. And 25% of our buildings are falling into that category. Another 25% are in the 11 to 20% bracket and so on. So we do have some baddies and they're the ones that have actually shown an increase. But there's reason for those. It's just, it's onto the show. It's not all good news story. Uh, obviously, there are certain offices that uh, have increased work hours over the last number of years. Uh, they've changed maybe what they were doing originally, but some have gone up, but the vast, vast majority have gone down. Um, 
this is a slide really that shows a lot of you will be familiar with the uh, building energy rating certificates for buildings and in the public sector those building energy rating certs are referred to as display energy certificates they look the same but they're calculated from actual energy usage and what I'm showing here is so they're on an A to G scale and what I'm showing here is what our percentage of the building stock in 2013 was and in 2015 was an average building so if you were absolutely average you'd be between a D and an E the DE line so the vast bulk of our buildings are better than that but what you can see is the baddies uh, the E's and F's and G's have pretty much reduced between 2013 and 2015 and they're shifting to the good side so it's just another metric that we can monitor how the general performance of the campaign is going because as i say it's based on actual energy usage as opposed to uh, modeled usage so just to finish off with some numbers the average savings as of september 2015 are 21% saving and it's an annual cost saving of around 4.9 million a year we're spending about a million euros on the campaign a year on the service provision but the savings more than justify that in gigawatt hour terms it's 43 gigawatt hours so with the success of the campaign, the government looked around a couple of years ago as to what was going on in the public, what, what, what uh, initiatives were taking place in the public sector. And one of the campaigns that was identified as being a possible template for use in the wider public sector, because as I say, OPW traditionally only deals with central government, was uh, our campaign, Optimising Parrot Work. So about two years ago, we were allocated 9 million euros to expand the campaign into the wider public sector. So we've taken it now using the same principles of installing the monitoring, providing specialist uh, expertise to work in the buildings, and we've expanded into hospitals, prisons, universities, institutes of technology, and local authority buildings. And bit by bit, we've been building it up. Uh, as I said, there's over 300 buildings now involved in it. Uh, some large hospitals are on, and some uh, more will be coming in the coming months. Uh, but we are seeing exactly the same experience that there is huge potential for savings from energy efficiency and from behavioral change. Change, uh, without major capital outlay. So I'll leave it there. I don't know if we've a chance or time to ask any questions. If there is any questions, I'd be delighted to try and answer them. Thank you very much.